Today, we dive into how you can use interns to do more while focusing on the most important aspects of your business that only you can do. Next on Make and Bacon. Hey there, I'm Jason Logston, and this is Making Bacon. We're all about helping you serve your fans, grow your income, and get the most out of your blog. Today's episode is brought to you by my very own Self-Publishing 101 course. The average home cook owns almost 50 times more printed cookbooks than PDF cookbooks. So why are you limiting yourself to only an ebook? With the advent of print-on-demand companies like Amazon KDP and Ingram Spark, it is now easier than ever to become your own publisher. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can waste not only your time, but also your money. After publishing 15 cookbooks, including a top 10 cookbook on Amazon, I know publishing, especially self-publishing, and I want to share my expertise with you. That's where my course comes in, stepping you through the entire self-publishing process so you can get your printed cookbook up for sale on Amazon without making any mistakes. You can check that out now at makethatbacon.com slash publish now. Now, on to the show. As bloggers, we often have a never-ending list of to-dos. A lot of the time, there are also just things that we need to do, but that aren't necessarily taking advantage of our strengths. If only there is a source of help that was inexpensive or even free. Luckily, today's guest is the perfect person to help us out. She helps bloggers and influencers work smarter so they can grow and scale their businesses faster. She created her food blog, It Is A Keeper, over 10 years ago and quickly grew it to a six-figure business. During this time, she honed her strategies and processes so that she can get more done with less effort. She now helps other bloggers and influencers grow and scale their online businesses. Today, she is a co-owner of the SmartInfluencer.com and co-host of the Smart Influencer Podcast, where she helps other bloggers and influencers be more efficient and skyrocket their productivity. I can't wait to learn from today's guest, Christina Hitchcock, from the Smart Influencer and and it is a keeper. Christina, welcome to Making Bacon. Hi, Jason. Thanks for having me today. I really appreciate it. I heard uh, Christina's presentation at the International Food Blogger Conference. It was very fascinating to me. I thought it was something that all of you would be interested in learning more about. And I can't wait to dive into learning more about how we can take advantage of interns to move our own blogs forward. But I like to start off every episode by asking, what is it like around your dinner table on a typical day? That's a good question. So we like to do dinner together as a family as often as possible, but more often than not, it's usually my family sitting around the table waiting for me to finish photographing food so they can eat it. <laughs> Cause we are, you know, as a food blogger, they're very used to eating cold food <laughs> because after it's cooked, I've got to photograph it before they can eat it. <laughs> Is there anything that you, it takes a little bit longer for you to photograph that they're just like standing on the side drooling and like really, really ready for it, but it takes a little bit longer. Yeah. That's usually when I, when we get to the difficult things, that's usually when they're willing to come in and help me. Usually I get the, oh, whenever I ask for help, you know, come hold the fork, come do this, come do that. Like I get like the, the huff and puff, but when they're starving, they're like, yeah, let's move this process along. I want to eat it. And then my son is always like, You're just yeah, he's always like, can I have the plated dish? The one that looks pretty with the parsley on it. Everybody else just gets it plopped on their plate. <laughs> we definitely have that. My wife will have a nice, you know, the plated one that's all pretty and mine's yeah. like just kind of a cut up mush that I <laughs> tossed in to, to hurry it up, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Because by that time I'm in like a full sweat and everything from going up on the step stool, down off the step stool. <laughs> oh, the life we lead. <laughs> yeah, the, the things our, our families put up with for, <laughs> for our businesses. <laughs> Most definitely. So I'd love to dive into some of the reasons why bloggers should be exploring using interns. Can you talk a little bit about how you got started using interns? Sure. I really think, I want to start off by saying, I really think it's an underutilized resource, especially in the blogging industry. So a little bit about my, my backstory and how I got started. Prior to blogging full-time, I was a marketing VP at a large nonprofit. And as with most nonprofits, you know, Budgets are tight. There's never enough help, but there's always a ton of work. So I had one other person on my team and we were literally swamped. Like we could barely keep our heads above water. And I think I just stumbled across something online one day or I was talking to somebody about using interns. And I'm like, hmm, I think this could be something that could help. So I started Googling everything and you know, I'm a voracious learner. I love to like devour information. So I was like getting all the information I could on it. 
and I reached out to my local school and was able to secure a couple of interns for the upcoming semester. And, you know, it was a learning curve. I mean, I was learning, <laughs> I was learning right along with them because I had no idea what I was doing. I knew how to manage people on my team, but interns, I think, come with a whole different level of management because they're not used to working in the real world. They're not doing all of the tasks that you would normally be doing, and you only have them for small pockets of time. So you have to kind of work with that. So after those first couple, like I was getting this down and I, <laughs> I started um, hiring more and more every semester. And then when I left that job and started focusing on my business full time, I think it was like several months, maybe even a year into it. And I was struggling there. Like, you know, it's, there's so many things to do when you're wearing all the hats, right? <laughs> you're doing social, you're doing photographs, as we talked about, you're writing content, you're doing the tech end, you're doing the front, you're like, you've got it all going on. And I, one day I was just sitting there and like, it just hit me. I had that aha moment. I'm like, I could use interns. Why can't I? Like, and I was like asking myself these questions. I'm like, there's absolutely no reason why I can't. I'm a bona fide business. You're like, I know how this works. Why yeah. am I not doing this? Why <laughs> did I not translate this into my own business? I mean, it truly is. I mean, I have something to teach these students. And that's what it's all about, is you providing an educational environment for students to learn from so they can take these skills forward into the real world. So that's kind of how I got started with it. And then from then on, it, it's just been part of my my business plan and how I, I work. It's a great way to separate yourself from a lot of the other bloggers that we do have those to-do lists that never end. Mm -hmm. What are some roles that you really find interns are well-suited to take over for people? So I like to use them for a number of tasks. And I always tell people, cause I get asked all these questions all the time when they find out, they're like, hmm, this is, this is really interesting. How do I do this? Um, I always start with, a couple of things first. Before you even think about what they can do for you, I want you to think about what you can do with your newfound time because it's no use taking on anybody to help you in your business if you don't know what you're going to do with your newfound time. If you're just going to fritter it away, scrolling Instagram or TikTok or something like that, it's not <laughs> worth your time, right? We, we need to, we're getting our time back so we can put ourselves into our zone of genius, making, doing those thousand dollar an hour tasks. So I like to say that first, figure out what you're going to do with your time, what's your why. Then after that, start thinking about the tasks, first of all, that you hate doing. And we all have those, right? Like I hate doing Facebook posts, <laughs> like detest them. Um, so that's a good task. Think about tasks that have a low barrier of entry, an easy learning curve that won't take too much time to teach and that doesn't require too much of your brain power. So things that, you know, really where somebody needs to get inside your head are probably not the best tasks to pass on, but something where they can learn from and, and really gain some experience. So I find that social media, all those different tasks that go with that are perfect because let's face it, students know way more than we could ever know. <laughs> I always joke. I was going to say, this sounds like a stereotype, but I'm pretty sure anyone in college knows more about social media than me. Yeah. And I swear that they are born with Instagram handles today. Like it just comes like stamp <laughs> on their birth certificate. But like there's not, they are always going to know more about social media than, than we know. So it's great to get their input and a different set of eyes and a different approach to how we do things. Because sometimes like we can't see the forest through the trees, you know, we're working so hard in it that we're not seeing what's actually going on around us. So those are two things I like to, to say, the things that you don't like the, to do, the things that are easy to outsource and that won't take up a lot of your time to train and to get somebody up to speed. Because remember, you only have them for a few months and then you're back to the start again. If it was something like social media, you know, something that you think that they probably know a little bit more or at least have better insights into it than you do, how do you, Approach that with them? Do you just say like, here's my social media, go at it? Do you try to give them tasks in some way that allows them the freedom to do their own thing? How do you approach that, that you're giving them enough direction, but you're also saying you probably have expertise here. So let me know what I need to be doing. Yeah. So I have a multi-pronged approach to that. First of all, whenever I bring on a new intern into my business, the very first task I give them, regardless of what they're doing, I don't care if they're doing video editing, social media, whatever they're doing. I have them do a brand audit. 
So I feel like this has been a great way for my interns to get a sense of my business and what I do and how I do things. And then I ask them to compare and contrast me to other businesses and brands. Sometimes I give them ones as a jumping off point. Other times I just leave it, you know, I let them freewheel and figure out, you know, what other brands to compare me and contrast me against because I like to see where their brains go with that. So I found that I've gotten a lot of really good information from the students, like things that I may not have thought of and different ideas then that I was able to incorporate into my strategies because it, it was something that came out of that audit. And then it gives them a sense of my voice, why I do things, how I do things, and a little bit more about my brand. That makes sense. So even if they're doing video editing, like you said, figuring out about your brand and your voice and your mm -hmm. style will help inform what they're doing regardless of the tasks that they're doing for you. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned you only get them for a few months. How long is the, the general length of time that you do get them? Is it one or two months? Is it longer? What does it look like when you bring an intern on? Okay. So first of all, I, when I, when I mention interns, I refer to college interns. I've never used a high school intern or any other type of intern. So I'm referring to college interns and I, the ones, the students that I have worked with have all pretty much followed the school semester schedule. So you have your fall semester, spring, and now we're in at the end of the summer semester. So I'm getting ready to wrap up my summer interns, but then getting ready to onboard my fall. So it kind of goes from one into the other. Every once in a while, I'll get a student that wants that intercession. So that's that time between the end of the fall semester and the beginning of the spring. So like those couple of weeks during the holidays. <laughs> You know, they're trying to get something in. I found that those are, those are very few and far between. And you normally have complete, like a hundred percent turnover in your interns when you're bringing them on every you know semester, or do you sometimes find an intern like as a junior that stays through, you know, multiple terms? Yes. To all of that. <laughs> I, have had, <laughs> I have had students that have worked with me for several semesters. So let me back up by saying most of the students that work for me, I do not pay my interns. So they are doing this work for usually for college credit or personal experience. Now there are a number of rules you need to follow in order to have an unpaid internship. And the, the Department of Labor has a test out there and you can just Google it to find it's a seven factor test to make sure your internship qualifies. So anything that, that I usually talk about falls in line with those seven factors, but so I have found through, you know, all of my experience, and I've probably worked with well over a hundred of a hundred interns throughout past career and my current blogging career, that most of them are good with the one semester they can get in their requirements, their required hours in, in that time. But then other ones, either they want more experience, like they finish their, their college credit, the required hours for their college credit, and they just want the personal experience and they really like what they're doing. So they want to stay on a little while longer. And if they're working well for me, I definitely accommodate that. I mean, I'm not going to turn it away. It's one less person I have to train for the upcoming semester. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I mean, it can go either way. It's a very fluid relationship. And I know you go into a few more, a lot more of the details, like the actual detail details in your course that you have to help people through manage this entire process. Mm -hmm. But if you, when you do have college credit, what does that even look like? Like, I don't even know how to start trying to get, put something together that people could get college credit from. So that is usually on the end of the, the student's end. So I will um, put together my job description document, send it out, recruit the students, interview. It's like a typical, you know, a typical job, right? You're, you're putting your offer out there, what you're looking for. People respond with resumes. You decide who you want to move forward with and you interview them. So it kind of goes in that process. So there's nothing out of the ordinary when it comes to that, but instead of putting it out to, you know, regular employees, you're putting it out to college students, whether it's at on the university level, like you're reaching out either through the career services or specific professors or things like that. But then once you get those discussions going, you'll find out one of my very first questions that I ask is if they're doing it for credit or not, because that for me makes a very big difference. If they're getting college credit for it, they've got a little bit of skin in the game. So they're more apt to perform better because 
something's riding on the line for them. But when it comes to that on my end, there's usually not a ton of extra work I have to do. I might have to fill out some paperwork at the start of the internship and maybe do a midterm evaluation and then an end of semester evaluation. Sometimes I have to sign off on timesheets. It just depends on how the school has their program set up. And the term of the internship will depend on how many hours they need to get in for credit. So. It's, it's hard to say what those hours are because it really depends on the school, but the one school I work with the most, it averages anywhere between 120 to 150 hours per semester. So we can work that out to be like 10 hours a week or so. Is that pretty much a regular range is about 10 to 15 hours a week that you bring on interns? It depends. Cause like I said, every single school <laughs> is different. And I have worked now with so many schools because I do it remotely. I'm not just limited to the schools in my area. I've worked with schools all across the country. So it really depends on the university as to how they set that up. Some are really bizarre and they only have like 50 hour requirements. Other ones, I've had some that have a 300 hour requirement. So it, it really depends. But that's usually one of the very first questions I ask. I wanna know if they're doing it for credit and how that looks on their end. If someone's interested in interns, how many does like a regular person that hasn't been doing this for as long as you have, how many interns should someone start trying to take on? One. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a hard and fast number. One. <laughs> Start there. <laughs> Get your feet wet. Work out all your bumps and your kinks with the one. So let's look, let's flash, flash back a little ways to when I was working full time and I started bringing on more and more interns. Well, I don't do anything on the small level. I'm a go big or go home kind of girl. So my first foray with interns, I think I had two or three, the very first round. And it was stressful. I started working out my bugs and everything. But then after that, I'm like, huh, all right, well, two is good. Five is better. So I actually, I think it was more like seven. I had that second semester. So I had this like giant whiteboard in my office and I would write every day what everybody needed to get done. I spent more time at that flipping whiteboard than I did doing anything <laughs> else. It was hard. It was a lot of work because I wasn't prepared. I didn't have everything figured out. I didn't have all my systems in place. I didn't have things streamlined like I would have liked. So that was like kind of like my trial by fire. So I do not recommend that to anyone. I don't even want to say how many I had at my my large, the, the largest semester where I had interns working, I almost don't even want to say it was like, it was an, an obnoxious <laughs> amount. And really all I did was spend my time managing because it was so many. So I recommend when you're getting started one, I know two might sound good and great, but stick with one. <laughs> the thing I found with outsourcers and freelancers, and I've been on both sides of, of that kind of equation, but I feel like when you're bringing someone on, you're like, okay, I have fleshed out what I need them for. I've written it down. Now I know exactly what to give them and you give it to them and they're like, here's a thousand questions. And you're yeah. like, whoa, okay. I didn't cover near this nearly as well as I thought I did. Yeah. And there's so much more handholding and being on the other side of the equation, I know it's not them just being confused. It's like, I don't know what's in your head. And if you don't put that down, like you have to, there's a lot more back and forth, I think, initially, until you really get those things kind of fleshed out. Yeah, and that was one of the things I did with my course. Like, I really sat down and looked at what it is that makes a program successful, like what makes that relationship successful. And it all comes down to being prepared. And I am a systems nerd. I need to have a system for everything. I'm always writing down, like, my own little workflows, like how things work and the order that they should go in. And I think this goes, like, when I was a, when I was a little, little kid, like in preschool, my mom came upon me and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm sorganizing. And it was part sorting, part organizing, but I made up my own little word because it was just things that I like, I, I've always been that person. I need to be organized and things have to be in a system for me. So I took all those systems, you know, for, for recruiting, I have a whole set of systems for hiring, for managing, for all the different processes that are in the chain of this relationship. I put together all my systems that kind of make it successful. So that training system is very important because like you said, if you don't cover it well the first time, they're going to be coming back to you with a hundred questions. And if you don't have enough tasks lined up, you may have underestimated how long it's going to take to do them and they'll be done with that task and they'll be saying, what should I do? What do you want me to do next? 
So if you're not yeah. organized, you're going to be answering that what do I do today question over and over and over again. And that can be. I love that. I love that concept of like really writing down those processes because mm -hmm. I feel like whenever you're doing a new task, you know, whether that's learning how to do food photography, you know, learning how to write recipes, bring on interns, regardless of what it is, I feel like there's the knowledge and education aspects and then there's like the application of it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the biggest benefits to me is that we can get a lot of the knowledge for free out there by, you know, we're learning a lot right now from, you know, everyone listening from your expertise, but actually applying it is so much harder. And I think that's where a lot of these courses, it's worth spending a little bit of money to have someone say, here's exactly how you apply that knowledge so you can be successful. And without that, you can struggle and make mistakes and waste time. And it's something that over time, I become a much bigger fan of spending a little bit of money to get those kind of processes and that the application knowledge down versus just like kind of know how to shoot a video, but that's different than having someone come in and say, I'm going to set up the lights for you and explain to you exactly what I'm doing. And now you look great and you've struggled on doing that your own for, you know, 40 hours trying to get your lighting right, but you just can't do it. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head with that. I mean, you could go out and Google all of this information I'm talking about, you know, and that I talk about in my course and by all means, feel free to do that. You know, Google it, cross check me, make sure I'm right. You know, get that, <laughs> get that information for yourself and then it, but it is the implementation of it and just knowing the ins and the outs and the pitfalls and the places where I wasted my time, right? Because I wasted a lot of time throughout my 10 plus years of working with interns. I mean, there was a, lo a lot of mistakes I made along the way and all the ones I share in my course are the ones that <laughs> cost me big and in return on investment. And I always talk about return on investment, meaning the time that you put in. You're putting that time in. You need to be able to get something out for that. So yeah, just paying a little bit extra sometimes for the implementation is, is so worth it. Yeah. It saves a lot of time and a lot of money. And most of us don't have an excess of either of those. Right. So it's good to do that. And frustration. <laughs> I mean, how frustrating is it when, you know, you're constantly answering the same question over and over and over again. So you talked about hiring them and where do you get started finding interns? Like, I assume you just don't go back like to the local college campus and put up one of those sheets of paper with like the rip off numbers at the bottom That's... of it. <laughs> well, you could do that. I mean, there's, there's nothing preventing it, but yes, I start off with, when I started, I started at my local um, university and you know, it was just through some good old fashioned legwork. I did a little Googling and, you know, tried to find the people that I needed to reach out to. But my recommendation would be if you're looking to get started with this, recruiting is actually kind of the second step in the process. The planning and stuff comes first. So when you're, when you move on to the recruiting phase, look at the colleges and universities around you. And maybe you don't have any that within your very immediate area, but then if not, then just expand your, your region just a little bit wider. And, you know, if it's not in your city, look in your county. If it's not in your county, look in your, you know, your region. But there are a lot of colleges and universities that offer so many programs that we can benefit from. So I mentioned photography. So that's one you can look in like the creative arts types type courses, videography, writing, social media, public relations, journalism. If you're looking to do some tech technology stuff, you might want to reach out to the different departments in the university that, that cover that area. Just really get in and research the university or school and see what kind of programs they offer, who the professors are. Most colleges and universities have a career services center, and that would be a great first place to reach out to. So these are centers that are designed to help students find things like internships and jobs. So they're always looking for new people to connect with and start reaching out that way. You know, we all, we all hate cold calling, but it's really not hard to send an email and just introduce yourself and, you know, ask what's the worst they can say is no, I don't have anybody or just not respond. I mean, that's really the worst that can happen. I feel like as far as cold calls go, that's one of the easier ones is calling up a, an organization that's dedicated to finding jobs for people and be like, hey, I am have some jobs for the people you're trying to help. Yeah. Yeah. I really have not hit much resistance at all. So it's, it's, it's not a difficult ask. <laughs> How do you manage 
all these interns, especially like remotely, is it like, I have enough trouble, like I work with my parents and like kind of ma helping manage them. I have, a, I struggle with that and we know each other really well. What is a way that you can really connect with someone that you might not know very like at all going into this process? Mm -hmm. so that's a great question. So all of my interns now work 100% remote. Prior to COVID, most of them worked remotely, but I did have some of my video interns. They would actually come to my house and help me film videos. Since then, I've come up with a system to make it all 100% remote so I can use students from anywhere. So prior, I mean, Zoom is my friend. I use so much Zoom, it's not even funny. It's really, I found the easiest way to communicate back and forth because you need that you need to be able to read that body language and see faces and ask questions and be able to screen share and things like that, especially when you're, if a student hits an obstacle, because you want them to feel like they can come to you and ask questions and get more information. So you need to be able to share that and show that. It was funny because before COVID, I mean, I was doing remote internships for how many years before COVID hit once. So we were in the middle of the spring semester when everything started shutting down and the students that I had working on video who were coming to my house were no longer allowed to, the schools weren't allowing them to go into internships. So that was the spring semester. That summer, I decided, well, what the heck? I'm gonna put it out there. I mean, I've been doing remote internships all this time. I put out my very first job description out there seeking interns. I had 70 within, I think it was like an hour, 70 applicants. I didn't even know what to do with myself. But the thing was, none of the traditional, or I say traditional, none of the big companies were taking on interns because they didn't know what to do with their regular employees, let alone worry about interns, right? They were still trying to navigate that whole mess where I was ready to go. I mean, I could take on <laughs> virtual interns anytime. I've been doing it for years. I had the pick of the crop that year. I mean, that was awesome. I could, I had some, some excellent schools that I was choosing students from. And it, it was interesting to see how that shifted everything. So, yeah. It's nice when everyone else is a little busy and the competition for jobs <laughs> goes away that you can uh, kind of swoop in there and get yeah. exactly what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any gotchas besides bringing on too many interns to start with that you see people run into again and again. Absolutely. I see people, or when I talk to people, they're like, oh yeah, I've tried that, but it's too much work. I can't, you know, it wasn't worth the time for me. That is probably the biggest problem I hear the most. And I'm going to say 99% of the time it's because they were not organized and they didn't plan it enough before they started. I can't say that enough, but planning is the key. And in my course, I say over and over and over again, the whole thing should be planned out before you even start putting your job description out there. You should be thinking of the exit interview and have that planned out before you even take on your first intern so that you've started to think through all of the processes and you really have your ducks in a row and you're not stuck managing them all the time and using up all your newfound time. Because the whole goal is to not only provide an education to the students, but to free up some of your time so you can work on more productive tasks. Yeah, you started this off by saying the first question is to figure out what you want to spend your time on. And unless that is managing a bunch of interns, <laughs> you should plan that ahead of time so you don't have to do that, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, Christina, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing so much of your expertise. If people want more about inter like learning to work with interns, can you talk a little bit about your course and what that provides and where people can find it? Sure. So I have a course called the Intern Strategy Course. And within that course, I walk you step by step through the entire process of um, recruiting interns, like designing your program, first of all, recruiting interns, hiring them, managing them, training them, and then closing them out at the end. I walk you step by step through everything, explain all the lessons I learned along the way. And I also share, and I think I've been told this is probably the most valuable part of the course. I, part of the course you'll get as one of the bonuses is my intern swipe file. So in this swipe file, I have every single email, document, template, and file that I use to manage my intern. So you could literally just take it, take my name out, put your name in and run with it. It's, you know, kind of keeps you from recreating the wheel. <laughs> 
that entire time, but it's, it's, I've been told it's probably one of the more helpful, the more helpful resources that I have in there. It's, I think it's six, six modules that walks you step-by-step step through, through everything. And then, like I said, you have the swipe files. I also have a recruiting accelerator course that I include as a bonus there. And it takes you, it's kind of like the fast track. You know, if you want to get up and going fast and you're not really sure how to, you know, package everything so you can move quickly, this kind of um, walks you through that and shares some of my tips and tricks for getting some interns hired really quickly for your business. So you can awesome. find I it. love swipe copy. That is oh, huge. <laughs> too. I'm all about that. I have entire files on my desktop with just swipe copy and things that, you know, that I can use. Definitely. That's why I put it in there. I'm like, this is really has no value if you don't have that. That's the kind of the gravy we all need. <laughs> well, that is perfect. It's a great way to move your business forward with take free up that time that you have. Your course sounds amazing. You have so much experience with doing this and you explain it in such a, a clear way that makes it sound like this is something that's easy to do. If you have the right, the right systems in place, yeah. anyone can do this. It's true. Anyone can. And it's really, it's such an underutilized resource for bloggers. I mean, nobody is doing it. So get out there and do it. I, I it may seem scary, but you just have to, like with anything else, right? You want to learn a new social media, you just got to jump in and do it. So like this, you just have to jump in and do it. I, my one takeaway too, I would tell you is try to, if you can stay away from friends and family. <laughs> I know like you might think, oh, I'll just post this on my personal Facebook page and see if any of my friends have, you know, children that are college students looking for a job. Always think about what you're going to do if your intern doesn't perform. So you do want to have to broach that topic with either the student and or the parent if things aren't working out the way you want them to. So always think about that because it's Murphy's Law. If it can go wrong, it will go wrong. <laughs> And it's always hard enough having that conversation with someone like this right? is not working out and you can't work with me anymore. But like, if you add on those additional layers of like, it's your neighbor and you're currently borrowing their lawnmower or something like it's just adding up a lot more. Yeah. It's, and I've been in that situation and it's delicate and you don't want to lose a friend over it. Like there's so many things to worry about and, and ultimately it's your business. So I'd rather work with strangers any day of the week. <laughs> It's just easier. <laughs> just removing one level of yeah. potential complexity yeah. down the road. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you so much for coming on. For more from Christina, you can head to the smartinfluencer.com. Also have links to the course in the show notes you can check out. And I appreciate you coming on and sharing your expertise with us. Thank you, Jason. This is fun. This has been Make and Bacon. We're all about helping you serve your fans, grow your income, and get the most out of your blog. Until next time, I'm Jason Logston.